In 1974, a woman was kidnapped from her apartment. But this story isn't like any other kidnapping story that you have heard of before. What happened after that woman's kidnapping was a bizarre series of events that would lead to one of the craziest cases that the FBI would ever have to deal with. Patty Hearst was born in San Francisco, California on February 20th, 1954. Her father, Randolph A. Hearst had five daughters, and out of those five, Patty was the third oldest. She went to private schools in San Mateo, Crystal Springs, Monterey, and Los Angeles, California, and studied at the University of California, Berkeley, and Menlo College. Patty is the granddaughter of William Randolph Hearst, who founded Hearst Communications, the country's largest newspaper chain and media organization at the time. She is also the great-granddaughter of Phoebe Hearst. Phoebe co-founded the National Parent Teacher Association, which is a formal organization comprised of parents, teachers, and staff that aims to encourage parental involvement in schools. Phoebe also founded the University of California Museum of Anthropology, which is now currently known as the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology. Anthropology in simple terms is the scientific study of humans, which includes historical and modern human species, as well as human behavior, biology, cultures, civilizations, and linguistics. So as you can imagine by now, Patty came from a very wealthy family. As well as being a heiress, Patty has starred in various film and TV roles and has written books. But most people don't know her from either of these things. Most people know her because of a bizarre incident that occurred in 1974 as being from that powerful, wealthy family proved to have devastating consequences. Patty shared an apartment with Stephen Weed, her fiancé, in Berkeley, California. On the night of February 4th, 1974, at around 9pm, someone knocked on Patty's apartment door. An armed gang of men and women barged in as soon as she opened the door. Stephen would then be knocked out when one of the gang members snatched a bottle of alcohol that Patty and Stephen were sharing and bashed it over his head. The group then threw Patty into a waiting car's trunk, opened fire on the apartment complex, and drove off. Patty wasn't kidnapped by any gang. She was kidnapped by the SLA. The SLA, or Symbionese Liberation Army, were a small, militant group of self-declared anti-fascists founded in California in 1973. Although the exact number isn't known, there was believed to be 22 members or less in the SLA. I obviously can't tell you about every single member, but I will tell you about a few of the main ones as they will become relevant later in this video. The majority of the SLA were past students from Berkeley, including Nancy Ling, a San Francisco native from an upper middle class family who graduated with a degree in English in 1967. She had worked at an orange juice kiosk on a campus in Berkeley in 1973. A former Minnesota social worker named Camila Hall was another member of the group and she had relocated to Berkeley. In Berkeley, she was living off the trust money from her family and produced line drawings and radical poems that she would try selling on the streets. Willie Wolf, another group member, studied anthropology at Berkeley after graduating from a prep school in Massachusetts in 1969. While he visited prisoners for a class, Willie who had given himself the nickname Sujo, met Donald DeFries, a bank robber who would later take over as the SLA's leader. Donald, who went by the alias General Marshal Sinkyu M. Tume, managed to escape from a prison in 1973 on March 5th by simply leaving a work assignment and going into a system of safe houses run by his new friends. They protected him from the cops while he started writing different manifestos and created the SLA's logo which was a cobra that had seven heads. Under Donald DeFries, the SLA started acting violently in 1973 which is when they murdered Marcus Foster, Oakland's first school superintendent that was black. And the reason they did this was because of his fascist support of requiring students in the area to bring identification cards. 
Marcus had in fact opposed the identification card idea, something the SLA didn't realize when they decided to shoot him a total of 8 times with .45 caliber bullets that were hollow that they had loaded with cyanide before the shooting. When 1973 was about to end, with Marcus Foster's murder still making headlines, the SLA made the decision to make a long-lasting impression by abducting the renowned terrorist Patty Hearst from her apartment. After eight days, the SLA issued a statement where they vowed to execute Patty, their prisoner of war, and demanded that Joe Romero and Russell Little be released. Joe and Russell were two SLA members who were incarcerated for the assassination of Marcus Foster. Death to the fascist insect that preys upon the life of the people was the letter's final line, which is largely regarded as the motto that best describes the organization. The SLA made the most of its newfound fame while Patty was being held captive. Following the state's removal to release the two SLA members, they demanded Patty's wealthy father give $70 in free groceries to every individual in need in California. Patty's father, Randolph Hearst, promptly took out a loan worth $2 million and donated the funds to a rapidly formed organization called People in Need. His well-intentioned efforts were unsuccessful and the food distribution program had to be suspended after hungry people ransacked the operation in the neighborhood of West Oakland, which led to rioting that left several people hospitalized. The SLA refused to release Patty once the distribution turned chaotic. Patty spent a lot of her time at the SLA hideout locked in a closet restrained and blindfolded. Different group members frequently essayed her and they made her endure sessions of Maoist consciousness raising. Consciousness raising is when you try increasing people's awareness of social, political or personal issues and Maoism is a form of communism. Patty adjusted her beliefs to suit the SLA and she was apparently given the option of being freed or joining the organization. Patty said that she desired to stay in the group and fight alongside with them when she was asked to decide. She was able to see her kidnappers for the first time once the blindfold was taken off. She then received daily instructions on her responsibilities, including training using her weapons. Patty recorded audio tapes at several points, which were later made public by the media. The first couple of audio tapes were the typical I'm fine but must do what they tell me to variety made on day 9 and day 13 of her being captive. Then, on her 34th day of captivity, with the violence and termination of the food distribution, her tone completely changed. I can't show you all of the audio tapes as this video will be way too long, but here are some of the important ones. This is the first recording's transcript on day 9. Mom, Dad, I'm okay. I'm with a combat unit that's armed with automatic weapons. And these people aren't just a bunch of nuts. They've been really honest with me, but they're perfectly willing to die for what they're doing. And I want to get out of here, but the only way I'm going to is if we do it their way. And I just hope that you'll do what they say, Dad, and just do it quickly. And I mean, I hope that this puts you a little bit at ease and that you know that I really, that I really am alright. I just hope I can get back to everybody really soon. This is the third recording's transcript on day 34. Mom, Dad, I've been hearing reports about the food program. So far, it sounds like you and your advisors have managed to turn it into a real disaster. You said that it was out of your hands. What you should have said was that you wash your hands off it. It sounds like most of the food is low quality. No one received any beef or lamb. Anyway, it certainly didn't sound like the kind of food our family is used to eating. Two months after being kidnapped, on April 3, 1974, Patty declared on an audio recording that she had decided to join the SLA and adopted the alias Tanya, named after Tanya the Gorilla, who was a spy, communist, and revolutionary that played an important role in Cuba's government after the Cuban Revolution and in several Latin American revolutionary moments. This is the transcript for that recording. Mom, Dad, Tell the poor and oppressed people of this nation what the corporate state is about to do. Warn black and poor people that they are about to be murdered down to the last man, woman, and child. 
tell the people that the energy crisis is nothing more than a means to get public approval for a massive program to build nuclear power plants all over the nation. I have been given the choice of one, being released in a safe area, or two, joining the forces of the Symbionese Liberation Army and fighting for my freedom and the freedom of all oppressed people. I have chosen to stay and fight. I have been given the name Tanya after a comrade who fought alongside Che in Bolivia. It is in the spirit of Tanya that I say, Patria o Merte Venceremos. Enjoying the video so far? Then make sure to leave a like and subscribe as it helps my channel grow tremendously. Now let's get back to the video. In 1974, on April 15th, Patty had been caught on surveillance footage robbing a bank called Hibernia, which was located in the Sunset District in San Francisco, and she did this while brandishing an M1 carbine. Patty shouted at the people inside to stand against the wall. The SLA opened fire on two men who walked into the bank during the robbery and injured them. The group had left with over $10,000. The beginning of the SLA's demise came one month after the group robbed the bank, when Patty went to a store called Mel's Sporting Goods in Inglewood, California at 3.30pm with SLA members William and Emily Harris. William and his wife Emily entered the store and made a $31 clothing purchase. However, an employee and the manager had questioned the Harrises after they left because they had believed they had been shoplifting. A scuffle occurs and following that, a .38 caliber firearm fell out of William's waistband. Then a hail of gunfire erupted from a red van that was parked across the street. The gunfire came from Paddy who was standing there with a semi-automatic firearm, a curly black wig, and sunglasses. The manager's wife was struck in the forehead by one of the ricocheting shots that also smashed the window and cracked the concrete. The pair managed to scurry back inside the shop without suffering any significant injuries. During the chaos, the Harrises hopped into the red van with Patty and sped off. The employees started to pursue the SLA members in his own vehicle, but he had turned around when William started brandishing his firearm. Due to this, the Los Angeles Police Department, or LAPD, issued an all-points bulletin for the vehicle that the gang had fled in. All-points bulletins, or APBs, are electronic information broadcasts that are delivered from one sender to a number of recipients in order to quickly convey a message that is important. Later, that van would be seen in front of a house, which was instantly surrounded by several police officers. Over 9,000 bullets were fired into the air over the course of several hours as the LAPD and SLA traded gunfire. Meanwhile, locals evacuated the neighborhood, which was now blocked off, and half of the nation watched the live broadcast of the incident on the local news. As the battle dragged on, two SLA members were killed while attempting to escape through the back, and one was killed by a bullet that penetrated the wall. Donald DeFries led his two remaining members into a crawl space underneath the house when police shot several gunpowder-activated canisters of tear gas through the window, sparking a huge fire that swiftly consumed the entire building. Gas masks had been melted to the group's faces when their bodies were later discovered. A total of six members of the SLA perished inside of the hideout, including Donald, who committed suicide by shooting himself. Paddy was initially believed to have perished in this conflict as well. When that was proven to not be the case, the Harrises and Paddy were the subject of arrest warrants for a number of offenses, including two charges of kidnapping. Paddy and the SLA were connected to a second armed robbery, this time of the Crocker National Bank, which was located in Carmichael, California. Marked money discovered in an apartment that she was hiding in is what linked her to the crime. The apartment was located in a neighborhood of San Francisco, California called Mission District. Patty was the getaway driver for the heist. Emily Harris, who had a mask on, shot and killed a 42-year-old mother of four named Myrna Opsall when she was in the bank trying to make a deposit. Patty was arrested on September 18, 1975, alongside Wendy Yoshimura, a different SLA member, 19 months after she was abducted. In 1976, on February 4th, which was two years after the kidnapping, Patty's trial officially began. The abducted victim, who spent 59 days in a closet and endured verbal and essay, 
was accused of robbing the Hibernia Bank with a firearm. Patty had remained loyal to the SLA in the days that followed her detention three months ago, but when the trial started, she had shifted her position. She claimed that the SLA had brainwashed her and had worried that if she attempted to contact her parents, that they would have killed her. F. Lee Bailey and Albert Johnson, who was Bailey's assistant, led the defense team off Patty Hearst. Bailey made the decision to pursue the plan of action of attempting to showcase that the SLA had brainwashed Patty, and she experienced what has variously been referred to as the Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is when captives form an emotional attachment to their captors as a type of coping mechanism. So according to Bailey's theory, Patty had never been a free woman or had voluntarily joined the SLA before being arrested. Critics claimed that the argument of being brainwashed and under duress had several flaws. Firstly, Patty's behavior and comments after the Hibernia heist strongly implied that she was behaving freely. According to critics, it was not essential to prove that Patty was still brainwashed during the entire period leading up to her capture. However, it was essential to prove that she had not been a free agent when the robbery occurred. Secondly, under federal law for a bank robbery, acquittal on the basis of brainwashing was unrecognizable, and the instructions that the judge gave to the jurors were he told them that Patty was clearly acting in the moment, as she was fearing for her life made declaring someone not guilty very difficult. Thirdly, the plan appeared to contradict the evidence available. If Patty had not been a free agent, then why did she have an Olmec monkey on a chain in her handbag the day she was arrested that was handed to her by William Wolfe? Why, on her apartment bookshelf, was there revolutionary books? Why, despite having multiple chances to do so, did she not flee? The judge's decision undermined the defense plan by permitting the prosecution to present evidence of words and incidents that occurred after the robbery to establish Patty's mental state at the time of the crime. As a result, the jury heard Patty on an audio tape say to Americans that the idea of being brainwashed is ridiculous. Patty was asked a lot of questions regarding what she did following the bank heist during the prosecution's cross-examination, which prompted her to invoke her Fifth Amendment 42 times. She also had to experience an embarrassing cross-examination about a variety of subjects, including her sex life, and hear humiliating expert testimony regarding her susceptibility. So why did Bailey claim that Patty was brainwashed? One explanation is that Patty's parents, who were financing Bailey's defense, encouraged him to use that theory. It appeared that Catherine and Randolph Hearst were unable to accept the fact that their child would willingly decide to join the SLA. Another possible explanation was that Bailey might have been afraid that by arguing that Patty's voluntary conversion occurred after the Hibernia heist, she would open herself up to prosecution in the future for the shooting she committed outside Mel's sporting goods a month after the bank heist. Bailey felt confident in his own abilities to convince jurors to agree with the brainwashing idea as well as having a psychiatrist prepared to testify that Patty had not been accountable for her deeds. And finally, it's likely that Bailey's choice was affected by the fact that he owns the book rights to Patty Hearst's tale. One might imagine that brainwashing would make for an interesting plot and improve his declining criminal practice. Defense attorneys turned down the prosecution's offer to let Patty plead guilty to almost anything in exchange for a light punishment and instead chose to pursue the brainwashing argument. Why? Well, perhaps Bailey believed he couldn't lose. The two sides' opening statements discussed the fact that the crime that Patty was being tried for was recorded on video. Bailey claimed that the SLA planned the incident to give Patty the appearance of being an outlaw. He would tell the jury that the SLA placed her directly in view of the cameras as if she was a prized pig. Bailey also said that maybe for the very first time ever in a bank heist, a thief was ordered by other thieves to reveal themselves in the middle of the crime. Patty Hearst afterwards shockingly saw the security videotape being shown by the prosecution before breaking down in tears. 
Going with the brainwashing argument required Patty to take the witness stand and explain to a certain degree how the brainwashing occurred. Unfortunately for Patty, many of the things the jury heard from her were not accepted. For instance, when Patty told the jury that William had essayed her and that she hated him, the prosecution displayed the Olmec monkey that William gave her which, as I mentioned earlier, was later discovered in her handbag after her arrest. Patty's lame response when asked why she chose to keep a present in her handbag from an abuser she despised was that she liked art and had taken lessons in art history. If the love ornament wasn't sufficient to provide an explanation, Patty herself described William as the gentlest, most lovely man that she has ever known in one of her audio tapes. After 12 hours, a decision was reached. Numerous jurors would leave in tears as Patty was found guilty of using a gun to commit a crime and armed robbery on March 20th, 1976 by a jury consisting of five women and seven men. In the end, the jury believed that Patty had lied so that she could try and fit the actions she carried out into a flimsy narrative. Patty received a seven-year prison sentence. In February 1979, Jimmy Carter, who was the 39th President of the United States, reduced Patty's federal sentence to 22 months, releasing her eight months prior to being qualified for her very first parole hearing. Patty Hearst was fully pardoned by Bill Clinton, the 42nd President of the United States, on January 20, 2001, which was his final day of being President. Patty got married two months after being released from prison. Since then, she has lived a somewhat normal life. She has two daughters and is currently 69 years old.